Hi folks, welcome to episode 70 of the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters. I am of course chosen by Bo, and today we're going to be talking about a little-known episode, a short window of time in pre-Norman Conquest English history, uh, the conflict between Harold Harefoot and Harthur Canute, and why that's relevant. Now, we were going to skip over this, and most history channels probably would skip over this, uh, but we're not going to because there is something relevant here, isn't there? Well, I certainly think so. And I thought if we're going to have a sort of an on-off series to do sort of all the monarchs, more mm. or less, I would like to, you know, spend a bit of time on some of the smaller stories like, mm. you know, Lady Jane Grey or or Edward V or something, yeah. you know, give them their dues because it's all important. Um, it's, the, it's the stuff that you don't hear about in mainstream political discourse as well. No one wants to talk about them because they don't have the sort of romantic or momentous impact of like napoleon or a caesar or anything like this you know and it's easy who doesn't know the stories of napoleon and caesar by now you know because originally we were going to do just uh just <clears throat> jump straight up onto edward the confessor mm. um and i was first had planned to just spend you know five ten minutes on this mm. but i thought no it is an interesting period and they were full monarchs mm. um so they were and, ruling, and it's interesting they were ruling over countries in times of political turmoil so yeah. And, um, you know, it's still, it's not a tiny amount of time, it's sort of seven odd years, something like that. Yeah. And also it sets the tone, really. It sets the picture for Edward the Confessor, as most people know, had a long reign, mm. really long reign. And, um, you know, his reign does set up, it really is, you know, exactly <coughs> the, the prelude to mm. the Norman invasion. Mm. Okay. So the prelude to that, really. Right. Okay. Um, so where do we begin? Okay. Well, we did finish... <laughs> We did finish um, the last epochs on <clears throat> in this series about mm. the monarchy uh, with the death of King Canute. Mm. Um, a quote from Mark Morris, he said, whatever Canute died of, it wasn't old age um, because he wasn't all that old. He was only about 40 or in his early 40s. What? King Canute? Yes. Talking about. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's interesting. But I've got a, a, just a sort of overview, general overview paragraph from the book The Anglo-Saxons by Mark Morris. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I just read that, just sort, sort of set yeah. the tone. Uh, for most of the 50-year period before 1066, the English were preoccupied, as they had been for centuries, with affairs in Scandinavia, and in particular with the fallout of the Danish conquest of 1016. That's the one where Falkbeard came over mm. and lots of killings mm. of, the, of the English. Um, an experience that was far more traumatic than is generally recognised. For the first half of this period, England was ruled by King Canute and his sons as part of a wider empire that stretched across the North Sea. In the second half, there was a surprising reversal, which saw saw the restoration of the ancient house of Wessex and the accession of Edward the Confessor, a son of Ethelred the Unready. These changes of dynasty made life for England's ruling elite extremely complicated. Ancient loyalties were eroded, identities were called into question, and deep divisions were sown with ultimately fatal consequences. Mm. End quote. So if you can imagine you're sort of uh, ruled by Canute, who is, mm. uh, you know, a, a Scandinavian man. Mm. Um, and then, uh, as it says there, in a 50-year period, it sort of flips back and forth a couple of times. Mm. So that's always very, very difficult, isn't it? Um, I think of an even much more extreme case is if you lived in somewhere like Eastern Europe yeah, in the 30s and 40s and 50s, yeah. uh, you know, you get taken over by regimes that are mm. polar, polar opposites really and you sort of can't win yeah. are you with the nazis or are you with the communists yeah and if you collaborated with either at any point yeah you're in trouble you're in real trouble mm. and um so if there's even like the suspicion that you did even um you know like uh, just to say ever such a quick note on that if uh, you were ever captured by the other side you didn't do anything wrong you were simply captured that is, was enough t- for you to end up in a, a camp or a gulag or something. It's, it was very difficult to avoid problems. You were persecuted by the Nazis, right? We're going to persecute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy, right? Yeah, it's mad. Um, okay, so when he when Canute dies, he hmm. didn't leave, as is often the case. Um, he didn't leave just clear instructions. They mustn't have been expecting their own death, then, right? Like quite often, yeah. You know that that that's the only reason that you wouldn't hmm. surely. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, well, in this case, I think that's that's that is the case. Mm. Um, in the case of um, William the Conqueror, he sort of failed to leave clear instructions, and his sons fought with each other. Mm. And he was he did die of he sort of an, old, an accident, but he was old. He should have made provisions yeah. by that point. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's sort of it's not very prudent to make. Why not start making provisions for it straight away? Mm. Um, so, for example, Henry the Second, 
Um, as soon as his eldest boy, Henry the Young King, was sort of old enough to be a crown prince, he made him a crown prince yeah. to try and avoid all that sort of thing. Um, so some people sort of, you know, can look well, into the, the, the argument. The argument will be, well, the crown prince will start getting ideas above his station and think, why do I need my dad around anymore? That is, That's the of argument. course, the worry. Yeah. Especially in the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages or anything like that, yeah. where things are much more brutal, much yeah. more cutthroat. Um, um, yeah, so um, I've got a quick little paragraph here from um, uh, Sir Charles Oman. He said, uh, Canute died in 1035 before he, had, before he had much passed the boundary of middle age. Um, he left two sons, Harold and Harthur Canute, the former the child of a concubine, the latter the offspring of Queen Emma. Um, with his death, his empire broke up, for Norway revolted, and the Danes of Denmark chose Harthur Canute as their king, while those of England preferred the bastard Harold. Well, it's pretty rough for Harold, though, isn't it? It's like, you're the son of a concubine, he's the son of a queen. Mm. I mean, if we're talking about questions of legitimacy, just, just saying. Yeah. It's yeah. not you, mate. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's bad luck. Uh, well, there's one thing where, uh, just to sort of try and um, help people's people get um, an impression of this if they don't really know anything about this. Mm. Um, Harthur Canute is sort of a baddie. It's hard to think of him as anything other than uh, a, a baddie, really, because he's much more in the Viking mould. He yeah, seems to just yeah. uh, takes um, English lives very cheaply. Mm. He sees, he's, we'll get into this later in the, in the episode, but he sort of views England as just something to um, squeeze money out of, really. He's much, much more... Um, a Viking hmm. than, a, than, you know, a strap king of England, where Canute had tried very hard his whole reign to um, smooth smooth things over. Hmm. Half of Canute, son of Canute, doesn't seem to care about that as much, anywhere near as much. Was he raised in Denmark or something? Um, I'm not sure was a, exactly. Was well, he was a viceroy of Denmark. Yeah, he like ends that. up going over there and um, being their king. Right. Um, yeah. But where he was actually <clears throat> raised in childhood, I don't know. Hmm. That's another thing to mention at this point, is that our sources particularly for this little window of time, are quite poor. Right. Um, before and after, we've got better sources. Hmm. Um, so, for example, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, but um, Harold Harefoot is, um, well, Mark Morris says he's one of the most anonymous kings we've got. Hmm. Uh, but there's reasons for that. There, we do know that there are specific reasons why the our accounts are so sparse. Right, okay. And it's sort of, sort of politics and things. Yeah, of course. Um Okay, if I could read uh, another little paragraph here from uh, the book The Anglo-Saxons by Mark Morris. He says, Immediately after Canute's body had been laid to rest in Winchester, an assembly was held in Oxford. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle calls it uh, a Wittener Gemot, literally a meeting of the wires, um, employing for the first time a term that had been coined a generation earlier by Ethelric. Uh, Ethelfric. Ethelfric. <laughs> Ethelfric of Ancient. Uh, the tradition of summoning national assemblies dated back as far as Athelstan's reign a century be before, but their constitutional significance is often overstated. The common assertion, for instance, that England kin kinship was elective seems less impressive when one remembers that until Canute's accession, every candidate had been a member of the same royal family, directly descended from Alfred the Great. Mm. Nevertheless... The impression is that the influence of assemblies and their ability to speak for the whole nation had been increasing, and the use of the word Wittena Gemot may reflect this. The earls and thanes who met at Oxford in the closing days of 1035 knew they had come to decide who should be the next ruler. Um, later, he goes on to say, and later in the book he goes on to say, it soon became clear that there was no consensus, and this is from... A uh, quick line from the Chronicle itself. Earl Godwine and all the chief men of Wessex, says the Chronicle, were in favour of Harthur Canute, the son of Queen Emma. Uh, they were opposed, however, by the thanes north of the Thames, led by Earl Leofric. Mm. So, <clears throat> Godwine presumably being the father of Godwinson. That's right, yeah. Uh, yes, very influential yeah. Earl. Um, interestingly, the, the, the legitimate succession is what's... Uh, they're, they're why well, I would call the legitimate succession, even though he's not very nice. Mm. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, Godwin, or sometimes mm. Godwine, um, uh, comes into it hugely. We'll come into it hugely in the next episode yeah. with with um, the reign of Edward Confessor himself. Mm. Edward Confessor and Godwine's lives 
and their power struggles are absolutely entwined, mm-hmm. massively entwined. So next episode, we'll be talking all about him, all right, about okay. his character, what okay. he did or didn't do. Yep. Uh, but he's already important. I mean, he's already... Yeah. Also, here's to mention that um, when Canute... Because part of Canute's policy was to, as I say, smooth things over, um, mm. to try sort of go native a bit, um, mm. do everything he can. And so most of the uh, Anglo-Saxons were removed from their from the sort of the top offices, mm. but one or two here and there weren't. And Godwin is one of those. Right. And in fact, um, he benefits massively. You could quite easily argue he benefits the most out of anyone. There's no other sort of... Um... So he plays his cards right here, mm. basically. Mm. And, and mm. This, this could be another argument in favour of him trying to play his cards right, because, of course, you know, the, the Queen's son is going to feel more legitimate than the concubine's son. Mm. So, you know, okay, I know you guys all like this guy, but mm. you know, I'm not going to get removed when half Canute takes over because I supported him. That's it. That's yeah. it. And, and, and so sort of the broader point, or exactly what you've sort of hit on there, is that God, Godwine is... Uh, uh, loyal. He's a partisan yeah. of yeah. the Scandinavian factions, mm. if you like. So where we talked about the concubine, I get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, where we mentioned that it's sort of a concubine there. Yeah. So it's um, <clears throat> Elskifu, and we mentioned in the one the episode about um, about Canute mm. that when they first came over in 1013, so before even the big year of 1016, mm. he came over with his son, with his father, uh, Sven Falkbeard. At that point, he married an Anglo-Saxon woman, Elfgifu, and right. he had two sons with her, mm. a Swain um, and, and this Harold. Mm-hmm. Um, just sort of cut that short. Swain is important, and they make him a regent somewhere in Scandinavia, and he's really important, but just before... Um, things all come to a head for this period, this mm. little window of a few years. He's, he dies sort of out right. of nowhere, of, and it's not really suspicious. No. So he's one of those people in history where he would have been a real key player. He probably would have been a king of England, might have been a king of England, might have been an emperor of that whole North Sea. But he probably got like tuberculosis or something. Yeah. yeah. Or you can get anything. You can get oh, a tiny yeah, little yeah, infection yeah. and yeah. it goes septic and that's the yeah. end of you. Yeah. Or whatever. We just don't know. Um, yeah. There's quite a lot of examples, aren't there? Like <coughs> Henry VIII had an older brother, Arthur, who would have been. No, there are loads. It's all over yeah, the place. Yeah. And it's, it's just so many examples. It's just like, right, bad luck. Yeah. Just bad luck. And we mentioned uh, Henry II's eldest son, Henry yeah. the Young King. He would have been yeah. sort of a, yeah, yeah. Um, a Richard Lionheart type figure, basically. Yep. Uh, but just, just died before he got his chance. Um, yeah, in uh, in uh, pre-modern times, if you're the second son, don't count out that you're going to oh, no, get a shot. Really don't count it out. It's almost yeah. like, well, not likely, <laughs> but, you know. Well, it probably is likely because I mean, your bro- your older brother probably is going to die before you, <laughs> but it's actually more likely probably. Right, so you, at yeah. some point in your life, you will be the king. Yeah, yeah. And um, another thing to mention, we've said it before in other ones, haven't we? But um, um, just for all sorts of reason reasons, people die kind of out of nowhere. Yeah, you're just not used to it in the modern world, Got are you? F- kicked off a horse, you know. Yeah. Drowned crossing a river, like yeah. bloody was it Barbarossa? Yeah, you know, like a, a piddling stream in the Levant somewhere, and it's like, right, that's him dead. Mm. Great empire, too bad. You know, these these things just happened. Falling off horses is really common. Uh, drowning, being yeah. in a shipwreck, yeah, it's kind yeah, of yeah. super common. Yeah. Well, there's the white ship. Isn't another great example of the white ship? Where, um, well, anyway, yeah. The, but uh, it's, it's, the, this is the point. This is not unusual at all. Mm. Mm. So when he dies, half the Canute, who is sort of you know the man who would be king, he's sort of as we say, sort mm. of the legitimate. It's sort of, you know, by law, that's not really a good way of putting it because... By, by really... custom, probably. Yeah, by custom, more. he really should be yeah. inherit it all, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Although that idea of primogeniture, where mm-hmm. the eldest son inherits everything, that's not written in stone no, at no. all, but, but nonetheless. But you, you, you are essentially stacking the argument. It's like, I'm the oldest, I'm descended from the queen, I've got a bunch of nobles who support me, and you're kind of stacking the argument in your favour. And, you know, it's usually how these arguments get won, isn't it? mm, mm. So, uh, when um, when Canute does die, um, uh, even though uh, one big faction hmm. of uh, the British Isles, we say, um, were sort of for him, and Emma of Normandy is, of course, for him, hmm. it's her son, um, <clears throat> and she's uh, just to very, very quickly say, she's a massive part of this whole story and the next one. Yeah, she's yeah. a big part. I mean, she dies of old age. Uh, of a fair few years, but a few years into Edward, Edward the Confessor's reign. So she's still a key player in all this. Key, you, key you can see her being a character in Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she's a Cersei yeah. type 
person, yeah. big yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Harvey Knut is sort of sent over to Denmark to reign as um, king in Denmark, first and foremost. I suppose that dynasty consider it sort of their first seat, I suppose you could say. Yeah, well, it is. Well, it is, yeah. yeah. It yeah. would be weird. They're the ancestral homelands, aren't they? Yeah, right, yeah. Because, of course, England, the land of the Angles, Angoland, is much richer. Mm. Um, and bigger. M- yeah, bigger, richer, and not just in terms of money, in terms of sort of resources and yeah. land and people, bigger population, all sorts of things. Nevertheless, he is sent over to Denmark to reign there. However, as I mentioned, one of those lines there, that they uh, there was sort of all revolts going on. Mm. At the time, and he's no push, pushover. He's no slap. As I mentioned, he's sort of he's sort of a baddie. He mm. he he's a cutthroat dude. Well, he's a Viking king. I mean, come on. You, you get know, in his way, and you it's... can't become a Viking king without being a bit of a savage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, if you get in his way, he will um, <clears throat> he will chop you into bits, sort of thing. So, Understandably uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because later on, uh, just uh, just a quick note on sort of the next one, Edward Confessor. He's really not that. He's no, one no. of these kings that yeah. just likes to spend a lot of time in prayer. Yeah, and stuff. But Very this half man. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But this half a um plays for keeps at all times. Mm. Um, so he goes over to Denmark. Um, but even for him, it's a real handful. He sort of has to re-establish their authority um, almost from scratch in a way. Mm. So where you would think they would hope Emma and her whole faction, Godwin and Emma and Harthy Canute, and like I say, big chunks of the British Isles are all on that side. Mm-hmm. Um, they would hope that he could sort of put down whatever he needs to do in Denmark, do whatever he needs to do in Denmark, come over, get himself yeah. crowned in Winchester or London or whatever, mm-hmm. and, uh, and we'll go- take it from there. But the problems in Denmark are just too much. Really? And he has to spend years there. Hmm. So he doesn't come... This is the key bit for the next few couple of years or more, is that he doesn't come back. And being absent in the ancient world, medi- pre-medieval world, is a lot different to being absent now. There's no Zoom call <laughs> that you can right. get everyone on to tell them what he wants. Yeah, no, absolutely. You really do need to be there, unless you've got some sort of regent who's who can wield authority mm. for themselves. But like that's dangerous, isn't it? Like having oh, yeah. an overpowerful general, say like a Belisarius or oh, something, yeah. that's a problem in and of itself. And Belisarius someone... being a terrible example to give here, actually. <laughs> Because he's, uh, yeah, he's ultra good. loyal, yeah, he doesn't ever revolt. But but, but what I mean is Justinian was paranoid about it, wasn't he? Yeah, he that's was, what yes, I mean. Yes, yes. Um, um, and so, <clears throat> and so, and and from Arthur Canute's character, he's the type that wouldn't tolerate something like that anyway. So, yeah. anyways, he needs to he needs to come back and sort of claim it for himself, and he can't. He really can't. The situation in Denmark's too perilous. Hmm. So we have sort of a well, kind of a holding pattern, really, hmm. and it's an odd. It's an odd period because you can tell that the the power dynamic is quite, at least to begin with, um, really quite balanced, quite even. Um, Because you know, whenever there's a dispute for power, if one side's got any sort of sort of advantage and they know how they know what they're doing, um, they'll leave it. Yeah, they'll leverage it, and and things will be over quite quickly. Mm. It's only when things are really finely balanced. Mm where it's going to sort of play out for a long time. And that's what happens here. And the problem with power is it's not static. It can't ever be fixed. Right. And so if you are you if you have a period, a prolonged period, a period of absence, then that's not good for you ever in any circumstances, mm. really. You know, the, the, the other person is then making his networks, forming alliances, building his base. You're there desperately trying to hold on to what you've got. Well, you know, that, that changes the scales, unfortunately. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that is exactly what happens where there's this holding pattern where, okay, so they hold uh, a Witten hmm. um, and uh, they, they, they don't, there's no consensus. And uh, so like the House of Wessex, which Emma is uh, oh. sort of, she acts as a, basically a regent hmm. in Arthur Canute's stead, mm-hmm. really. Um, and now, so she's um, no spring chicken. Nope. And, but also she's a, She's a real political player in her own right. Again, just one more example of where women really do, can and did wield power and authority. There are loads of these. Yeah. Just all over the yeah. place. She's got a political voice entirely yeah. of her own. Yeah. Olympias, Eleanor of Aquitaine. You know, just... Her own treasury. Yeah. yeah. All sorts of towns she... that are personally loyal to her. She's basically a feudal lord. Yeah. 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 She, she really is. Yeah. 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 And it's not like that some, some places, I think it was Exeter, um, uh, they're not loyal to necessarily the House of Wessex. They're not loyal to Arthur Canute. They're loyal to her. Hmm. 
because she's been a big player for years and years and years yeah. now. You know, she was queen. She was married to Ethelred the Unready yeah. and queen yeah, 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 years yeah. and years ago. She must seem like just a, like Queen Elizabeth II, in fact, a permanent fixture of the landscape. Yeah. 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 I think it's fair to think of yeah. it like that. Um, and so what we see is that um, a lot of the, uh, I mentioned one of the other uh, massive uh, lords or thanes, mm. uh, Leothric, mm -hmm. and they decide um, that, you know, Hartha Canute is he's a Viking. We don't necessarily want that. I mean, Based, yeah. w we've only been um, sort of under their thumb since 1016. Yeah. You know, it's only been so 20 years. Right. Yeah. So it's not Matt. It's totally living memory. Yeah, yeah. Why do we have to keep going with this dynasty, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can't we have, a, can't we have yeah. an Anglo-Saxon guy? Yeah. So, great, great questions being raised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally legit <laughs> yeah. question. Yeah. What um, we're asking now, I think. And so this <laughs> this concubine that he sort of knocked up in 1013, yeah. uh, Elfgifu, yeah. it also seems that she is totally a player in her own right as well mm. uh, because she plays the game. Yeah. Um, she gets completely involved in it sort okay. of again okay. for, for herself or for her own party or faction. Yeah, for her dynasty. As well. Of uh, Harold Harefoot. Yeah. Um, and so um, one of the things we can say, if I just take a sort of short a very short time out to talk about the the sources hmm. um um of course we've got the um we, we've got the anglo-saxon chronicle itself yeah. and later emma commissions a, a history the encomium all right okay which is um the, so that's very neutral yeah <laughs> no uh, of course his, uh, historians know <laughs> that it's entirely biased but um once you know that yeah they still figure useful. that in. Yeah. yeah. It's still useful in other ways. Don't think of it as just the out and out truth, but it's still yeah. useful. There, there is a life of King Edward. Again, this mm -hmm. is a little bit later, but it talks about these events. Yeah. Again, completely biased, utterly biased. There's um, Henry of Huntingdon, pretty much con contemporaneous, a bit, ever so slightly after. There's a John of Worcester. Mm -hmm. um, there's a William of Jumierge. But there's also the coins. Mm. And in history, people will know that coins is a whole thing. It's like oh. a whole area of, of history and well, research, all of, so, its, all of its own. Let, yeah, just to give people a brief summary, though, coin, mm. coinage is a form of ancient propaganda. Uh, it's probably the best form of ancient propaganda because you know that people are going to have them. You know, <laughs> they're highly desirable. When you take over and you've got, oh, we've got, you know, a thousand pounds of gold in the treasury or something, great, mint coins with my face on and then the other side of the coin will have whatever my great deeds are, whatever great thing about me are, you know, like Hannibal minted, minted coins with elephants on the other side, for example, and his face on the other side. So co coins are a form of ancient propaganda and they, they, they signal legitimacy above all else. I produce the money, you know, my face is on it, my crest or regalia or whatever it is, is on it, and you're spending it. You need it. So it's legitimacy. That is fundamentally the point. Because propaganda in and of itself could be completely hollow, couldn't it? Oh, yeah. Whereas... There's nothing minted real. coins. Yeah. It's, it's, literally, it's, this is gold. You know, it's a physical representation yeah. of your power, mm. isn't it? I mean, oh, there's yeah. no, just no denying it. Yeah, yeah. And I won't go into it too much because, apart from anything else, it's not really my forte. But mm. um, people do know the coins inside out, absolutely inside out. What 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 all the symbolism is of the things oh, yeah. they choose to print yeah. on it, and all sorts of stuff. Like if you're shown to be holding a, a sword and an, and an orb. Yeah. a scepter and or if you're yeah. shown to be mounted on a horse and all these different mm. things and the, um, the the coinage was taken incredibly seriously like in the middle ages mm. the the punishment for clipping coins which is you know taking a small amount off each coin and then building it up so you're a bit richer uh was castration a really bad punishment uh so don't clip coins folks you'd be in a lot of trouble <laughs> There's one bit, you're absolutely right, coin yeah. clipping is a real no-no because it yeah. flies in the face of your entire structure of your society in some yeah. sense, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and it's just dirty, isn't it? It's just dirty and cheap. I mean, I think even now today, why around the edges of our coins, you've got the, the usually be nudges or niches or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's to prevent people doing it nowadays. It shows it hasn't been clipped, yeah. All right, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, in fact, I'm just, while we're on that, just, I think it was in during the reign of... Um, Henry the first, so that's one of William the Conqueror's sons. Um, at one point, he ordered like all the moneyers in the north or something to be executed Did he? because they were like debasing <laughs> the coins and they were clipping and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, right, I'm just gonna do away just with them, yeah. all of you. Yeah, um, yeah. Or, or ordered both their hands cut off or something really, to us, something super really, draconian. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. You say to us, super draconian. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting flexible on this. Sort of I stuff could be these persuaded. Days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're undermining the national currency of England. I think there's a there's something to be said about that. 
Mm. Well, it's up there, isn't it, with sort of um, destroying or, yeah. or damaging the fundamental pillars yeah. on, on what your society is based Which on. That's why George it? Soros shorting the pound was bad. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Or, um, yeah, move on from that. <laughs> uh, um, so we can see from this period yeah. that, uh, from the coins particularly, mm. Uh, where at first the, these two factions, the the Harold Harefoot and the Harthur Canute factions, are they're both print, uh, minting their own coins, mm. and you can see that they're pretty much on, on a par ish. Yeah. And you can start to see, and it's quite quick within a year or two, that the the uh, Harold Harefoot, the Elfgifu, the Anglo-Saxon, if you like, faction, their coins seem to become more prevalent, ah. and the Harthur Canute House of Wessex ones not so much. Mm. And so that speaks volumes in lieu of, you know, decent literary evidence. Yeah. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? Um, I have to say that we, we do have to be careful with, like, found coins from the ancient world because they're not necessarily representative. And this is, this is one of the issues with things found from the past is this is just what was lost, right? Right. And right, so there's yeah, a kind yeah. of selection bias to mm, it. True, um, absolutely. So, like, you know, if we dig up – the, the, the great example is, of course, the planes that were being shot at by the Germans, and they came back, and the planes were full of holes in certain areas. So it's like, oh, we need more armor in those places. Like, yeah, but the places where they don't have holes are the places – that didn't take them down. That's mm. what the plane can fly with. Right. You know, those planes that got shot down actually needed armor on the underbelly or whatever, you know, and it's that sort of thing. So, you know, who knows, but the, we don't know, you know, but it, it's probably a fair assumption, but just to be aware of it. Basically. That's a good example. Yeah. If the fuselage is shot through and the plane got back, well, don't worry about it. Yeah. Then don't worry yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. That's not... okay then, isn't it? It works <clears throat> yeah, still. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, like you say, some sort of selection by So if you found yeah. um, a massive cash, just, by chance, you found a massive cache of coins, hmm. which makes it look like... Yeah. For example, they could have been buried by guys who are fleeing from one regime. Uh, and they're like, right, we'll bury our treasure here. Uh, but it might have been like the last batch of their coins or something like that, because the people who have won. Uh, but they're the only coins we find. And so we think, oh, well, all of their coins. This Actually, no, we're, talk we're talking about the losing faction in the Civil War. They're trying to hide their loot, you know, that would have otherwise been melted down, re-minted re into... The winning faction's coins, and so, but the winning faction's coins, of course, were just spread everywhere and people were using them. So you don't know, you know? So mm. it's, it's, it's one of those things where, the, like, I, again, I'm no expert, but it's just logically the selection bias is something you have to be concerned about. And again, I'm not saying either way or anything, but it's just be aware. You know? Yeah. 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 No, it's a, it's a great example. Like, you see, if you find archaeologists find, I don't know, a particular type of graffiti, yeah. and, if that, and they think, oh, everyone did this, no. it's like, no, it you don't might know. be just that one thing. Yeah. You don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, when, you know, people bury things for lots of different reasons. Very few of them good. Though. Mm. Very few of them showing that, oh, this is a sense of strength and pride and power. You know, usually it's the people who are on the receiving end of something bad that try and hide things, you know. Right. So, it, you know, it, like a lot of the stuff we get is kind of the loser's remains a lot of the time, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's, it's hard to know. So like the, 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 the giant grave burial things where it's like, oh, here's the grave of the king. That's actually a lot more useful. So it's like, you know, here's the ancient warrior's armor and the chariot and the horses. Like, yeah, because lots of people took a lot of time to put that together, you know. So that's actually really useful. Like the random hidden coin burials and stuff. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how useful they are, you know. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.